Good evening. I'm Alexia Brew, co-founder of Well and Good, um, a media company that covers the latest news trends and advice in the wellness space. And I've been following the careers of these three remarkable entrepreneurs and wellness experts for many years. So it's a special thrill and honor to moderate this evening's discussion. There's no mistaking that we're in the middle of a profound, healthy shift in the way we live, what we at Well and Good and others have referred to as the wellness revolution. For context on the speed of this transformation, eight plus years ago when we launched Well and Good, there were just two SoulCycle locations and you could list the number of nutrition bar brands on 10 fingers. Wellness is not one size fits all. It's really a matter of finding your own personal recipe for vitality and health. And new ingredients are being added all the time. For example, most of us weren't talking about adaptogens, collagen, or spiralizers even just a few years ago. Who better than these three food gurus, Candice Kumai, Ali Mafuchi, and Tanya Zuckerbrot, to talk about the ingredients of wellness and help us each find our own personal recipe. I'm gonna let each panelist introduce herself far more powerfully than I could with this question. What was your wellness aha moment that launched you on your current path, and how and when did you decide to start your business? Ali, let's start with you. Uh, first off, thanks for 92nd Street Y for having me. I feel so humbled to be next to these beautiful, powerful, inspiring women. Um, so I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. Um, so to tell my story, basically it started with my mother, and she will be very upset if I don't start with her. Um, <laughs> basically, I was with my mom, and she had discovered spiralizing. And she was spiralizing on her own and invited me over for dinner one night and she wanted to serve me these veggie noodles. And this was in 2013, to give you context, early 2013. And I went over for dinner, I had these noodles, and my first aha moment was the first time I tried those noodles, and I remember thinking, wow, this really tastes like pasta. How could this raw vegan noodle, you know, zucchini noodle taste like pasta? And I was blown away, and the light bulb aha was, if I put a warm sauce on this and maybe some meat and some cheese, it'll taste like real pasta. And as an Italian-American woman who always struggled with portion control, loves pasta, um, everyone loves pasta, you don't need to be Italian-American or a woman to like pasta, but I really liked it. Um, so I basically took her spirals her home that night, and the next you know, night I made a dinner for my husband and I, and I did shrimp, tomato basil sauce, and I took one bite, and I was right, it tastes just like pasta. And I said, well, maybe everyone knows about this. I'm, I'm not the first one to know. So we went online and we looked at who, you know, searched zucchini noodle recipes, spiralizing. And if you can believe it now, a couple things maybe popped up and they were all raw vegan. And I was blown away by that. Um, so a couple months went by and then my second aha moment, my last aha moment happened. And I was sitting with my husband and I was so excited about spiralizing. It sounds so nerdy, but it's so true. I was so excited and I just blurted it out. I was like, I'm just so inspired to spiralize. I'm in spiralized. <laughs> and I was like, and my husband was like, write that down. And basically I just was so consumed by this. I was sitting at my desk job, writing, waiting for lunchtime to come so I could write down recipes. And there's this you know, balance shift where I was happier writing recipes and I was miserable in my job. So I pretty much went into my boss's office and I quit. Um, it wasn't very, uh, you know, I was crying. <laughs> um, but I quit and the next day I just bought Inspiralize.com, registered my social media handles and I started from scratch with my blog. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Candace, how about you? <clears throat> wow. Your wellness aha moment that launched you on this current path. <laughs> you, Alexia. First of all, thanks, dude, for coming, you guys. This is amazing to see wellness grow into what it is now. Like, I adore each of you, and this has been quite a journey. And thus has my um, career, which has turned into quite a process of imperfection that's turned into being perfectly imperfect. When I was about 15, I started modeling. Um, it was career day at school. I went and signed up for modeling, of course, in San Diego, California. And after the course, the, um, one of the local modeling agents decided to sign me because I was tall and lanky, and I'm half Asian, I'm half Japanese, and half Polish American. I grew up with immigrant parents who were very tough on me, who never made me feel like I was ever good enough for anything. And they still don't. 
<laughs> and that's how it just is. As my mother likes to say, you know, you are good at many things, but you are really confident when you talk, when you are doing your presentation. So we kind of knew that their tough love was what would launch me later into being in front of a camera for modeling, feeling comfortable, fit modeling, print modeling, and traveling all over the world between the time I was 18 to about 28. And somewhere in between there during culinary school, post-college, I got pulled onto the first season of Top Chef. We didn't know what it was. I was studying for intro to meets class, no joke. I crumpled up the piece of paper I studied on, and then I turned it over and I was like, what's this Bravo logo? And it said from the producers of uh, Bravo's Project Runway comes Top Chef. Real story, true story. I asked my friends, I'm like, dude, should I go to this casting? I just found a paper, they're like, hell yeah, you're gonna go. And the rest is history. It went from Top Chef to being a host at HSN to being a host at Lifetime, TLC, Homemade Simple for Discovery, a talking head on uh, Food Network and Cooking Channel, and then judging on Iron Chef America, Beat Bobby Flay, and then being a guest host on shows like E! News, and now a regular on Dr. Oz, The Today Show. And I penned six books in between that period of time and was a food editor at large at Shape <laughs> and Men's Fitness and a columnist at Men's Health and Women's Health. And really, it just snowballed into... Your parents um, still aren't happy. Parents <laughs> still aren't happy. I was just gonna say, still wasn't good enough for them. If any of you here have immigrant parents, so you'll know what it's like to grow up feeling never, ever good enough. So uh, I, I had a horrible breakup a few years ago. I had a trip planned to Japan. I went to go see my grandmother, Bachan, who was passing away in southern Japan. And while I was there, I had moments of aha that said, excuse my language, but why the fuck am I trying to fit in <laughs> for so long in clean eating and wellness when I was always born to stand out? And my aha moment was studying the monks my ancestors, those who have survived war in Okinawa. I interviewed people for over 10 trips for about seven years, and I put together this new book called Kintsugi Wellness, and I put my heart and my soul back together while writing that book and finding the courage to get over the breakup and simultaneously accept that I will forever be perfectly imperfect, and that's where I am now. Thank you, Candace. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Tanya, I would love to hear from you. These are um, tough acts to follow. But, uh, <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I agree, I'm humbled by the panel, so I'm really, I feel so grateful to be here this evening. So to answer your question, my aha moment, I think people who know me um, think of me as like a weight loss guru, and I have to say, it's the last thing I expected to be when I set out to become a registered dietitian. So when I finished my residency, which occurred at NYU University, and your rotations include oncology and renal and cardiovascular rotations, you even work in the ICU as an extension of the medical team. You're putting together tube feeds for people in comas. When I went into private practice, weight loss, frankly, seemed beneath my skill set. It seemed like that's like what you go to Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig to do. Here I was a clinical dietitian, and um, I saw myself as an extension of a medical team where doctors would refer their clients to me to prescribe nutrition intervention to help their clients get healthier. And in an outpatient setting, um, the patient populations that benefit the most from nutrition intervention are cardiovascular patients and diabetic patients. So that's who I was working with in private practice. And doctors were sending their patients to me. And my job as an extension of the medical team was to prescribe diets to lower lipid profiles and to help manage blood sugar levels with the intention of minimizing symptoms of these clinical conditions and hopefully to get these patients off of their medications or perhaps lower the dose. Whether it was Lipitor or Glucophage, um, that was the ultimate goal. It was purely health. So based on what I had learned at NYU during my master's, I had understood that fiber had many clinical nutritional benefits. Fiber helps to lower cholesterol. Fiber binds with cholesterol and ushers it out of your body. So I knew if I prescribed these cardiovascular patients a lot of fiber, I could naturally lower their cholesterol levels. For the diabetic patients, I also recognized, that it was taught to me in school, that fiber slows down gastric emptying and leads to fewer net carbs. And therefore, if I could feed the diabetic patients a diet high in fiber, they would have better insulin control because they wouldn't have that much glucose entering into their blood system. So after three months of following the diets that I had created, these 
clinical patients of mine would return to their, cardio, to their cardiologist and their endocrinologist for what we call a repeat blood workup. Let's see how they're doing. Let's measure their hemoglobin A1Cs. Let's look at their lipid profiles. And across the board, everything we had set out to accomplish was being accomplished. Cardiovascular patients saw their bad cholesterol, their LDL come down, their triglycerides came down. All my diabetic patients were getting better blood sugar control, but something else was happening. Across the board, all these patients were losing weight. And I had, not set out, I had not set out to produce weight loss. So you can imagine, I'm even scratching my head going, why is everyone losing weight? <laughs> like, I did not mean for weight loss to be a byproduct of any of this. And there were also two very distinct diets because when you're prescribing diets to cardiovascular patients, you really focus on saturated fat, on lowering that. For the diabetic patients, you're really worried about the sugar content. So when I looked at the commonality between what I had thought were two very distinct diets, the commonality was fiber. I was prescribing fiber for the clinical benefits and the weight loss was a wonderful byproduct. And what ended up happening was because I was working in outpatient setting, weight loss is pretty evident. I joke that if I was a chiropractor and I was fixing people's backs, no one would really notice. It's not like when you walk into a party, like, wow, Candace, your back looks amazing. <laughs> but when someone loses like, let's say 20 pounds in three months and they walk into a party like, wow, you look great, what happened? Oh, my cardiologist made me go to this woman to lower my cholesterol. I lost 20 pounds in three months. So my phone started to ring from the colleagues, the friends, the family members of my clinical patients saying, I'm friends with John, but my cholesterol is fine. Can I get the weight loss part of what he did? Or, hey, I'm friends with Jane. My sugars are fine, but can I get the weight loss part of what she did? And that was the birth of the F-factor diet. So my aha moment, to answer your question, was prescribing fiber for the clinical benefits and and seeing that it, that it was pr producing weight loss. Mm -hmm. Often people um, are overly generous and they say to me, you know, you were so ahead of the times, you were the first to talk about fiber 20 years ago, you know, you discovered fiber. Well, I did not discover fiber. It's been around forever, people. It's in all the foods <laughs> God meant for us to eat. And when people even say that, you know, I discovered it for weight management, I humbly say, I discovered it the same way that Isaac Newton discovered gravity. He was sitting under the apple tree and apple falls on his head and he discovers gravity. I was prescribing fiber for the clinical benefits and the weight loss was a byproduct and therefore I really stumbled on it as a solution. But that was my aha moment. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so people are undoubtedly waking up to wellness across the country and world and there's a lot of information out there, much of it conflicting. And even the phrase wellness revolution can make it seem more intimidating than wellness really is or should be. In what ways do you strive to simplify wellness for your audience or your customers? And Candace, I'd love to hear from you. You're in touch with so many people. You've published so many books. Um, how, do you, how do you really simplify things? So um, along with the aha moment in realizing that right now is a, a great time for us to talk about celebrating our differences, I don't know how, again, same thing that came across, I believe, for Ali and Tanya also, timing is everything and it is the essence of our lives. Yeah. And I felt that when I, I'd been going to Japan since I was five, but I realized that following what my ancestors did because the longest living woman was Japanese and she just recently passed away at 117. She lived south of Tokyo. She followed a Japanese diet and my grandmother lived till she was 96 and just passed away. And it's fermented foods. It's a lot of very low carb, but high nutrient, lots of sea vegetables. And I also started to look at their practices as well. The Okinawans that I've been interviewing for years grow their own food and they cook their own food for each other and they socialize quite frequently through their 90s. They don't actually have a word for retirement in Japanese or in Okinawan culture either. So you will continue to work until you pass away. And so these are the things that I said, if we can just go back into time and start focusing on the wisest, those who have lived a full life instead of trends and diets. And as we, you know, we worked together at well and Good for so long and our careers have all intertwined as family. And what we find is that truly going back to what grandma and grandpa did is an incredible way for us to simplify things. She did not care about what yoga mesh pants you were wearing and she did not care about the charcoal lemonade. She cared about miso shiru, gohan, 
sakemono, like these very simple Japanese things, fermented pickles, white rice, miso soup, and sea vegetables, relaxation, we both love onsen, mm -hmm. and spending time with each other, meaningful time, not wasted time, and certainly not wasting your time with toxic people, people you don't like, and people you don't want to follow anymore. Ali, how about for you? I mean, learning to cook is obviously such a critical piece, and I think your message is really easy to, to grasp. Um, how do you like keep things simple for your yeah, audience? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I come at it from, um, you know, I, everything I do is on this social platform, and I take it very seriously because I have people, even one person following me, I take seriously. Um, even when I had 100 followers to now, my, my following, I just, I take it very seriously. So something I do to simplify it is, you know, I'm very, very honest with people about how, how I live my life and how I live it in moderation and how I, I like to live in balance. I show people the pizza I eat, I show them the cookies <laughs> I eat, but I show them the smoothie I have. And I just, I'm always talking about, you know, I like to live like a general 80-20. It's not like, oh my gosh, 80% and 20%, but 80% of the time I feel myself well, I eat very well, you know, mainly plants, that kind of thing. 20% of the time I enjoy myself, you know, I drink wine, it's probably more than 20%, but um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I have the piece in the cookies and I find that like you're saying, you know, happiness goes much farther than we think it does. Happiness, what it does to our body, the way it reduces stress and, and the things that stress put on our body, people underestimate how much happiness can, can make your skin glow, can, you know, peak your energy levels and that sort of thing. So from an influencer standpoint, I try to be as raw and real because I find that that helps. And I, I think I do live very simply. I don't use adaptogens. Um, I don't even drink matcha. <laughs> I know you're very into matcha. Um, but I try, to, I try to keep the products I use very limited because I find it can get really overwhelming and there's a lot of stuff out there and there's products flying all around and there's, there's butters that are blue now that people drizzle on pancake stacks and it looks beautiful. But I think that's maybe where people start getting overwhelmed. We'll do I need this blue adaptogenic butter. You know, is that going to make me healthier? So I like to keep my products down. I don't use many supplements aside from like a basic protein powder, which is sometimes collagen, and that's really it. Um, and then just being raw and real. That's great. Yeah. Tanya, I'd love to hear from you on this. I think I keep it simple through education. Um, I've, my, I, we all are in a very crowded space. And I find that sometimes it's people with the largest platforms doing the loudest speaking who are the least qualified. And therefore, rather than dictation, I believe in education. Because if I can educate anyone, and now that information resonates with them on a cognitive level, that's where the buy-in happens. I don't have to oversell. The science is what makes it so sound. So I believe that by taking the time to really educate people, a little bit of anatomy, physiology, inorganic and organic can, you know, watering it down so it can be, you know, no pun intended, like easily digested in layman's terms. Um, I want people to feel empowered. And you feel empowered when, as I said, something resonates with you on a cognitive level where you're like, oh, that makes sense. Once someone teaches you one plus one equals two, it's always going to equal two. And one thing about education, yes, nutrition is a very young science, and I recognize that um, you know, things seem to change year after year, and there's like a new study that may be contradicting the study from the year before. But ultimately, we know that some things are really sound, and therefore, if we can build upon that. So I don't want to just tell people in this audience, eat more fiber. I want you guys to understand why. And I do this a lot using my social media platforms, or when I do lecture, or certainly in private practice and speaking to clients. I want them to understand how it works about net carbs, about their glycogen storage capacity, about the thermogenic effect of fiber. And through education, even though it sounds very highbrow, it's actually not. Like, as I said, you can deliver very sort of complicated scientific messages really simply. And I think that's where I've been able to really connect with an audience. And they're not eating this way because Tanya said so. They're eating this way because once they understand the science, eating any other way than the F-factor way seems illogical. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we've seen at Well and Good, people really crave actionable advice. And so I'd love to hear from each of you on three things that people can start doing and three things that people should stop doing next week if they want to turbocharge their <laughs> wellness overall. Um, so, Allie, you look sure. ready to take this question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I brought my notes because I had two, three good ones, and I wanted yeah. to make sure I remember <laughs> them, but I think I remember them. Um, so, 
the first thing, again, I'm coming from such a social mindset, um, but the first thing that, to do, I would say, which has helped me tremendously in my life, is purge your social media. Stop following people who don't inspire you. Stop following people you're comparing yourself to because you are not them, you're yourself. You shouldn't compare. Stop following people you're hate following, no matter how fun it can be. <laughs> like, just stop. Like, nothing good comes from it. Oh my God. You know, people that bring <laughs> negativity in, I hate follow sometimes. People that bring negativity into your life, you know, just, just go through a purge of that on Instagram and you'll notice when, because a lot of people are on Instagram, even Facebook, and you'll notice when you start flipping through, your mood just shifts and you follow people like Candace uh. or Tanya. And you will, you'll just feel more uplifted. Um, I would definitely sure. recommend doing that. Um, my second one is to go through your fridge and pantry and just do, again, kind of a purge. Don't eat the food that isn't necessarily good for you and restock it with things that are healthy. I'm not saying going buying all these crazy foods, but like basic vegetables, non-processed foods. Don't go crazy, but what I find in the way, lead, like living a balanced, well life is when I'm at home, I, am, I have all these tools to eat well and feel my best so that if there's a spontaneous dinner on Wednesday night that I wanna go to, I can go and feel okay about that because I, I eat and nourish myself mostly at home, that I can have a drink on the weekends, and I find that that can really help people balance, because it is really hard to balance, especially in New York, there's so many fun things to do all the time, but if you go and just kind of look at your pantry and say, okay, that, that has, you know, that's, a, that's something processed, let me replace it with something healthier, and we're lucky now that there's so many foods out there that um, can help us. Mm -hmm. And then my last one would be to meal plan and meal prep. I know that everyone talks about that, but it's kind of like the whole drink more water, it's really good for you, it's just so good for you to meal prep and meal plan because life is hectic and what I was talking about before with happiness, if you can spend an extra 30 minutes at nighttime with your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your kitten, your dog, um, making, you f making you feel happy in those 30 minutes instead of like stressing about what you're going to make for dinner or even cooking dinner, I think that can really go a long way. So those are three actual things I would definitely do now. Do you want me to answer okay. the, the not to do? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, not to do. I would say either ditch the scale or don't use it very infrequently. I, um, I'm gonna go on a tangent here now, but I, I, had, I got diagnosed with Bell's palsy. For people who are here who know me, I shared all about it on Instagram, and what happened was I had a baby months ago, and over the winter time, I looked at the scale for the first time. You know, you get weighed when you're pregnant because the doctor weighs you, but I was like, I'm pregnant, I don't care. But what happened was after postpartum, I looked at the scale and I'm like, wow, you know, I, I need to lose that 35 pounds that I gained. And I just went crazy. I was doing really intense workouts, stressing my body out, eating really, not restrictively, but just like eating very cleanly and just obsessing about it again, going back to like years ago when I had, you know, um, bad views of what wellness is. And I stressed my body out so badly that I got Bell's palsy. And they, they're not sure what causes it. They think it's a, you know, it's a pinched cranial nerve, but they think it's um, like a virus or something like that. I didn't have any viruses. I didn't have Lyme disease. Went to an acupuncturist for Western medicine, and they said, you're stressed, honey. Like, you need to, you know, pull it back. So, um, you know, ditching the scale. Long story short, the scale is what stressed me out, and it just brought so much stress. Even if you think you're, you know, you're, you, you feel good and you, there's a number on the scale, it just changes your whole mindset. So ditch that. Um, I'm gonna forget the other two, so let me look. Um, oh, feel guilty about missed exercise or an unhealthy meal. Do not feel guilty about that. Should be no guilty thoughts at all. Um, oh, and overbooking your life. This is another thing that caused my BP, as I call it now, to flare uh, out. I was just doing too much and I was overbooking myself and it was almost like you're afraid to be alone with yourself for a day. You wanna like go to this event and that event and see that friend. So just stop overbooking yourself. It's okay to even take like a week, a month off. You'll find a lot of cool things about yourself. That's great. Tanya, can you share your three start doings and three stop doings? I agree, I wanna make sure that I don't <laughs> miss anything because it's a long question. So the three starts. Okay, I'm gonna say them out loud first and I'll speak to each one so I don't forget them. It's gonna be a little obvious. First one to start is eat more fiber. <laughs> I'll speak to these in a little, with a little bit um, more color. Drink more water. I know you guys all thought I was gonna say drink more wine, but that'll come next. <laughs> and the next one is focus on gratitude, which I think we talked about. So the first one, eat more fiber. Um, you know, eat more whole foods, but eat foods that are high in fiber. It brings carbs back to your dinner table, back to your meals. Um, fiber has so many amazing properties. 
from the clinical benefits that I spoke about earlier from lowering cholesterol and anecdotally, I used to have a cholesterol above 300 when I was in my 20s. My internist wanted to put me on Lipitor. My mom has high cholesterol and by eating a high fiber diet for 20 years, my cholesterol, I'm proud to say, is under 200. We know that fiber lowers cholesterol. We know that fiber manages blood sugar levels. We also know that fiber helps to lower estrogen dominance, which is what's linked to breast cancer. So fiber lowers breast cancer risk, colon cancer risk. We even now understand that fiber reduces inflammation in the body. Inflammation is linked to every autoimmune disease, everything from Parkinson's to MS. It can help to reduce the symptoms associated with those diseases. It also can help to reduce symptoms of alopecia, psoriasis, and GI disorders like Crohn's and colitis. So we know that fiber has so many clinical benefits, and then of course fiber has many weight management properties, um, and it also helps with evacuation, which not only detoxifies your body, but helps you have a very flat stomach tummy and feel very clean and all those good things. So eat more fiber. Number two, drink more water. When we are dehydrated, being dehydrated mimics the symptoms of hunger. And often we reach for things like a Snickers bar or a snack when we really needed a zero calorie bottle of water. Um, so stay hydrated is also extremely important for digesting um, all your foods and of course for having fiber swell in your body so you can feel twice as full. Um, when fiber swells, that's when it sends a satiety hormone to your brain, cholecystokinin, and that's what sends this full message because we know fiber has no calories, so why does it keep you feeling so full? Because of the space that it takes up in your stomach. And lastly, for ladies, um, water is so important and staying hydrated for your skin. I always tell clients, a grape and a raisin, same fruit, but a grape is nice and plump because if it's hydrated, it's filled with water. Raisin, same fruit, all wrinkly, because it has been dehydrated. Now, I don't want to look like a raisin. I'm sure you guys don't either. So on F Factor, we always say drink three liters of water. Um, so, so far, I've said my three things. My two are where eat more fiber, <laughs> drink more water. And my last one is have more gratitude. Um, someone um, on the panel, I forgot, it was, I think it was you, Candice, right? You said about gratitude. People who um, are People who experience gratitude are the happiest. You know, they always say happy, the happiest girls are the prettiest girls, but truly people who feel gratitude um, are the happiest. There's a beautiful saying in the Torah, and I, I won't say it in Hebrew because I would butcher it. So I'll say it in English. The English translation goes somewhat like this. Like the one who's happiest with, someone who's happiest with what they have is the, someone, who, someone who's grateful for what they have is the most happy. Therefore, you know, we all know people who, you know, may have extraordinary wealth, a duplex, a driver, and they're miserable. And yet you could live on a desert island, and if that's your definition of happiness, you're happy. So one of the things that I try to do is every morning, before you even get out of bed, try and think of three things that you're happy for. I'm happy I have a roof over my head. I'm happy that I'm going to have coffee within a few minutes. I'm happy that there's this cute guy next to me. Whatever you're happy about, just, like, think about those three things. And then repeat that exercise right before you go to bed. We know that when we're stressed, your body produces cortisol. And cortisol is the worst thing in the world for weight management and also for like many other clinical conditions. But when you are happy, it actually minimizes cortisol production, which is not only great for health, but great for weight management. But just having those moments of gratitude, and you guys, it takes literally 30 seconds. Do it in the morning. Before you get out of bed, just say quickly three things I'm grateful for. Before you go to sleep, close your eyes, three things I'm grateful for, and you'll find like this feeling of happiness really like washes over you, and it just puts things into perspective. So guys, three things, eat more fiber, drink more water, and try and find more gratitude at the beginning and the end of your day. Now, three things that we should be not doing, once again, let me just um, <laughs> respectfully to you guys, meaning I don't wanna waste your time and just make silly stuff up, let me give you my three important thoughts. Okay, three things that we should stop doing, okay. I can come back to you. I got it. All right. But you can if I'm okay. talking too much. No. Okay, but the first one, I'll say these really quickly. Um, I would say the first one because I hear this more often, so I'll probably say one so I can turn the mic back to you guys. You guys, stop mistaking healthy food for healthy with weight loss. And this is a lecture I give often. There are so many healthy foods out there, acai bowls, quinoa, avocado toast. These are inherently healthy foods filled with monounsaturated fats, healthy carbs, but they may be interfering with your ability to lose weight. Um, so olive oil, one of the healthiest foods out there, monounsaturated fat, low, you know, lowers LDL, increases HDLs, got it. 
every tablespoon is 135 calories and 15 grams of fat. When you're trying to lose weight, foods that have caloric density can interfere with weight loss or weight management. So it does come down to moderation. Do not cut out healthy fats, absolutely not. And don't cut out anything. All food groups fit into a well-balanced diet. But I think what we're seeing because of social media, and you guys may notice this, big foods, like big pictures of foods, are very appetizing and appealing. So you don't just see one piece of whole wheat toast with three slices of avocado. You see two huge like chunks of bread this thick with two avocado halves and then two poached eggs and then like something else. And that breakfast is probably six or 700 calories. Is it glorious to look at? Is it gonna get a thousand likes? Of course, it's beautiful food. But it's very deceptive because people are thinking that all this healthy food is suitable for weight management or possibly even weight loss. And then they can't understand by eating all this healthy food why they can't lose weight or why they're having trouble maintaining weight or in some cases gaining weight from eating avocado toast. So it all comes down to moderation, of course, but knowledge. Knowledge is power. So I'll just say one of my three. But um, don't confuse healthy with healthy for weight management. That's really Back helpful. Back to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Candace, last but not least. Uh. <clears throat> I'll start with my don'ts because I hate it when people tell me what not to do. Um, I'm an ultimate rebel rule breaker, like have been since I was a kid. So um, number one, don't wait around for anything. Don't wait around to meet the person of your dreams. Don't wait around to pursue your career and your dreams. I've been waiting my entire life for some what I call stale old bread at the top of every network to tell me what to do with my career. Not anymore, not anymore. I celebrated a birthday last week and I was like, fuck all y'all, I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> and so I shot a 13 episode podcast over the last three days and we will launch it next week. And it is called Wabi Sabi and it is about being perfectly imperfect because that is exactly what we all are. Don't wait around, you guys, just don't, because you do not know where your life is going to be in the next few years. Do not let other people make decisions for you. This is your life, and if you've got one to live, make the best of it. Uh, number two, don't, uh, I want you guys to learn the term shigata ganai in Japanese. Can you guys all say shigata ganai? It means it <laughs> cannot be helped. In Japanese, the women say they live long because they practice shikata ganai, shoganai. It cannot be helped. Except what, what cannot be changed, move on from it. If you can't please everyone, move on. I've got a lot of stubborn friends, some were lifelong, and you know what? I have to move on from them sometimes, as hard as it's been. But self-work to trade the Judgment for acceptance, shigata kanai, cannot be helped. Um, and lastly, on my don't list, <clears throat> don't take it personal. As Don Miguel Ruiz says in his book, The Four Agreements, it's one of the best things we can practice. If somebody is being a real shithead to you, don't take it personal. It's not about you, it's clearly about them. Uh, the do's, which I love, because this is what you can do like crazy. Number one, pray for others. I love saying prayers for others, especially stuff I can't control. I always just say, I'll pray for them. And it doesn't have to be religious or anything of the sort. Maybe it's just sending them good thoughts. But I certainly agree with what everyone's been saying on the panel too. Unfollow the people that don't make you feel good and then say a little prayer for them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is that like the same thing, like the hate follow? I don't do hate following. <laughs> and also, um, the do. Look to your heritage. Everybody in this room can take one of those tests. You can talk to your parents. You can talk about your grandparents. Talk to your great aunt. Talk to a friend. I talked to my great aunt, Takuko Nechan, about all things Japanese. She taught us about how they survived through World War II, how they fled from the bombs, how my grandfather, who was an impressionist painter in Japan, was painting in Tokyo, and then they had to escape back to the countryside because they got bombed out. And I learned a lot about other people's heritage and took what they learned. The wisest and the longest living to me are the most impressive. Mm -hmm. And I took from that good. And I said, why am I so worried about Instagram and, and you know, the workout class or if I, if I made it on time or not? These things aren't really important in the scheme of life. 
And the bigger picture at the end of the day is what we are all saying, your happiness is the most valuable thing in the whole world. And looking to the elders in Japanese culture is what they do as a form of respect. And so what I'd like to do in my studies is also bring back respect to our elders all over in our everyday lives. Think about somebody who dropped a little wisdom on you next time, somebody who made you feel good. Think about them and value them instead of beauty, power, and money. Because our culture in the US loves to talk about positivity and how positivity is everything. So is money and power and beauty. In other cultures, they look to wisdom. They look to their ancestors and they respect their elders. Think about looking to someone who taught you something, who volunteers for an organization, because in the end, we're also only here to really be of service to each other. And lastly, practicing wabi-sabi, the hardest struggle of my entire career. Starting out in the modeling industry and having a Japanese mom and a tiger mom at that, and Polish-American dad means very stoic and black and white. Like my dad barely talks, if you can believe it. Uh, and we are the same, from the same family, very stoic. Um, but my mom, you know, now we have this joke. We have a three-legged cat named Kiwi that I found in like a dumpster in LA and I handed it to my mom and she says, you dump her on us and abandon her. She's kind of like your child. When you have children, you are not going to dump them on us, okay? <laughs> so Kiwi has three legs and one of them's a little stump and it's like a little, it's like, like a Captain Hook peg leg. And every day, one of the greatest pleasures in my life is being able to call her and say, how is Kiwi? And she goes, oh yeah, you know Kiwi, Wabi Sabi. Like, Aww. so perfectly imperfect, right? All three of her legs, her white whiskers, she's like, I'm going to call her Fu Man Chewy now. She has like these white whiskers that come out of her black fur <laughs> and a peg leg and some of the whiskers broke off the other day and she catches birds like crazy and drives my parents nuts, but Wabi Sabi. One of the greatest pleasures you can have in your life is accepting the imperfections and making something fucking great out of them. Just like I did with my life. Wabi sabi. <laughs> Wabi sabi. Thank you, Candace. Um, so my last question, and then I think we're opening it, opening it up for audience Q&A, um, is around entrepreneurship. So all three of you are incredible experts, but you're also really inspiring entrepreneurs. And there's so much happening in wellness um, entrepreneurially. And I'm sure there are many aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience. So what advice would you give um, aspiring entrepreneurs in this space? And Tanya, I'd like to start with you since you, when we chatted, you said you've always been starting businesses. You were selling rocks as a child, <laughs> which I remember. So um, how do you know if you're an entrepreneur and what advice would you give? Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you just know you're an entrepreneur, like I shared with you. My first business was selling rocks. I took them from my backyard and put a table in my front yard and they <laughs> sold rocks. Were they crystals? I had some really nice neighbor that bought one for a dollar. My best friend, Kathy, is in the front row and she's gonna kill me for this. I've been best friends with my friend, Kathy, since the third grade wow. and she and I had three businesses together. The first one was TNC, Tanya and Kathy's, um, Beatique, and we sold beaded bracelets and we went around on the middle school and you got to choose what beads you wanted and then you got to select your bracelet. Our next business was TNC Boutique and we made bow barrettes. I don't know if you guys remember bow barrettes and we put them on Velcros, but we were very clever because everyone had these like velvet barrettes. Um, and we realized that the metal clasp was the most, ex the springy barrette was the most expensive part. So what we did, and we knew that the fabric was the least expensive. So we went to the fabric district here in the city with all these fabrics, made these bows. And what we did was we packaged three bows on Velcro with one metal barrette. And that was our TNC boutique. <laughs> and then um, fast forward till I was getting my master's in nutrition and Kathy was already working in fashion and I suckered into being my business partner, and we launched Tanya's Tasties. I don't know how somehow the TNC <laughs> became just Tanya's, but the, T, the Tanya's Tasties, um, I launched, we launched the, the first fat-free rugelach company. So <laughs> if anyone's Jewish, you know that rugelach, three pieces of rugelach people equal one big mic, Mac and calories, so we thought this was very disruptive, and it did fairly well. We got into <laughs> Starbucks and Henry Bendel's. Um, anyway, so, my point is that when you are an entrepreneur, you are always looking to create value, make the world a better place for others through whatever it is that you're producing. It's been something that's 
in me, in my bones. I now stumble upon, um, everyone say hi to Kathy. Hey, Kathy. <laughs> Sorry, she's going to kill me. But um, does anyone here know the Gigi carrier that we've created? OK. Kathy, who I said works in fashion, one more shout out for poor Kathy. They do licensing <laughs> for really big people, exact pose and this and that. Her company actually created our GG carrier. So it's so nice that I've been best friends with Kathy since the third grade. We've had three failed businesses. Hopefully this one will finally work out for her. But um, <laughs> Kathy's company is making our GG carriers, if you guys have seen it. Anyway, um, back to entrepreneurism though. But yes, it's something that's just in you. And I guess my message for anyone here who has their own business, take heed to this next message. And for people who sort of know me, I am spiritual. I have a very strong connection to God. If you don't believe in God, replace God with the universe, with what I'm about to say next. Rejection is God's protection. And what I mean by this is when we want what we want during our business cycles, if it does not work out for us, do not have a defeatist attitude. When that door closes, it's because God has something better in store for you, the universe does. A few years ago, I was trying to raise capital, and it was a very dark time in my life. It was, I was like struggling financially. I was, um, you may know I've gotten divorced. I was going through a very challenging time in my marriage, and I was trying to raise capital to make something of my business. And I was really, really scared, and I was going out every night. I was seeing clients all day long, and at night is when I'd go out to try and raise capital. And I was taking meeting after meeting with all these men, and some had good intentions, some didn't have good intentions, and I was putting myself out there. And at the end of all this, I was exhausted. Um, I felt defeated, and I could not raise capital. And I look back now, and if I would have raised capital, it would have been at a valuation that's much less than where my company is today. So I'm so proud to say that, but I couldn't see it at the time. It felt so defeating for me, and I almost filed for bankruptcy as a businesswoman. And now, thankfully, F Factor is doing okay. We sold down 20 minutes, people, today. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was unable to raise capital. Uh, um, my failure, my failure to raise capital left me in a position where I now, where now my company is profitable and successful. I own 100% of it. Yay. So, it's fantastic. Um, you guys, rejection is God's protection. You can apply this to anything in life. If you wanted that shoe so badly and the store sold out, I promise it would have given you a blister. If that guy broke <laughs> up with you and you're like, oh my God, he was a man of my dreams, he would have cheated on you. Trust me, rejection is God's protection. You can apply this to anything in the moment. It feels so unfair because if you think of yourself as a good person, as a hardworking person, as an honorable person, what we want is based on our understanding of what we know, which is only the past and the present. Only God is all knowing. And therefore, when we want something, we don't know it all. God knows the future, and therefore, if you have faith in God or the universe or in something bigger than you, when things don't work out today, if you truly have faith, it's working out perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Allie, any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, a lot of things that Tanya was saying in my head, I'm like, it's resonating so strongly with me. I think um, she's saying something about, you know, rejection, don't be afraid of it, it's gonna obviously, it's for the good. One of my favorite sayings is, um, if the plan doesn't work, don't, don't change the goal, change the plan. So you, you know, there's, there's other ways, you always keep your goal in mind and don't get thrown off if it doesn't work out. If you're rejected along the way, you can just set your sails a little differently, but keep headed to that same goal. Um, you know, I came from, my grandparents on both sides were entrepreneurs. My father's an entrepreneur. My husband's an entrepreneur. I've always been surrounded by entrepreneurs. I never, my dad never wore a suit and went to work into an office. I just never thought that it was, my destiny was to be working a job. I always thought I would own my own company. I just didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. So on that note, I get a lot of people saying, you know, I, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur. I'm just like, oh, well, what's your business idea? Or what are you doing? And they say, well, I don't know yet. And what I say to my advice for people like that is, Twofold. One, if you're not, if you have the idea and you're not thinking about it all the time where you don't think about anything else, then it's probably not a good idea. It should consume you. You should be obsessed with it. You should really believe in it because you're going to be, you're going to be, you know, obviously promoting it all the time and selling yourself and selling your product, whatever it is. So really um, be a, I, be very passionate. My other um, piece of advice for the people who don't have the idea, I always say, Go to as many events, go to events like this to be inspired, to meet people. Don't ever be afraid to walk up to someone. Someone came up to me the other day and I said, 
you know, I, yeah, I would love to connect. You know, do you have a, do you have an email or something? And like, oh, I don't have anything to give you because I don't have a business. I'm like, you are your business. You are your person. You are the one who's going to make this business incredible. So just put your name on a white card, <laughs> even if you write it before you go to these events and give it to people so you can connect that way. Um, but just network as much as you can. And networking can be something like going to a different fitness class and talking to someone. You just never know who you're going to meet. And I think there's a lot of great events online. There's a lot of great events in New York City to attend. Um, there's a lot of just ways to meet people in different industries. So take advantage of that. That's great. And YouTube and Google everything because you'll figure it out that way. Yeah. That's how I figured out my business out. <laughs> um, so we have so many questions from the audience. Candice, I'm going to ask you a question from the audience. Um, how have you monetized your Instagram? Um, yeah, how did you start making money off of social media? Wow, that's a great question because I actually wrote a piece on that. Um, <laughs> for Girl Boss, I wrote a, a piece on how to monetize your Instagram, and, and uh, I sort of love curveballs too, so thanks for whoever asked this. I believe in content creation that matters and that makes a difference and that has meaningful messaging behind it. I also believe in high quality imagery. I did photograph my last book and I do pho photograph all my own work. So education is key. Learn how to shoot a camera, figure out WordPress on your own, learn how to start your own newsletter. You can utilize something like MailChimp in order to get your list going. First and foremost, protect yourself by creating a beautiful website and an, um, a newsletter list that can keep you going because if all social media falls away tomorrow, what else are you gonna have? You're gonna have your newsletter and you're gonna have your website. Keep them pretty, tight, neat. Put great information on there that nobody else has. Do something great with your life. And if you can try to finagle a business angle behind your Instagram, for me, I'm very picky about who I work with. If I don't endorse the brand wholeheartedly. If I wouldn't recommend it to my best friend, won't do it. I probably lost out on, I'm not kidding at this point in my career, probably close to a million dollars or more in endorsements because I say no to Monsanto, I say no to Diet Coke, I say no to Splenda, you name them, I've said no to all the bad boys. And I like bad boys, but not like that. <laughs> but just say no because in the end, the people who keep their clout and their integrity up, those are the people who will end up making it in the end. I was once also called a multifaceted hustler, and it's because here's what we know. If you become a, a, somebody who's just good at one thing, you will be washed over in this industry of wellness right now. If you become somebody who knows how to do everything well, you become very valuable to every brand. I just signed with another great client, Belvedere, and I not only shoot imagery for them, but I write content, I host their parties, I host the dinners, I write recipes for them, and I also utilize smart, savvy, useful material for them to use. So great. think about yeah. how you can be of good value, and that's how you can cash out. Great. Tanya, we have two questions for you here. Um, if you have a sweet tooth, what do you recommend eating? And do you prefer six meals a day, two meals a day, or intermittent fasting? All right, so the first one, if you have a sweet tooth. Um, so for people who know me, um, I don't have a sweet tooth, I have a savory tooth, so you'll find me choosing potato chips over gummy bears any day. But if you have a sweet tooth and you're trying to be mindful, like I love a chai tea. That is like one of my favorite things. And I do this after dinner often, like when you do want something. So I steep, you can use any kind of milk. You can use a coconut milk, a soy milk, an almond milk, a cow's milk if you want skim milk. And I put my tea bag in there. You could sweeten it with whatever sweetener you people choose. Um, that I always tell my clients, like really will help to alleviate a sweet tooth. And the second question was, but no, I have, people who know me, I got potato chips. <laughs> That's my temple. More than sweets. I, either sweet or savory, but yeah. The other question was, do you prefer six meals a day, two meals a day, or intermittent fasting? Um, I definitely do not encourage intermittent fasting. The reason it is so popular is because it produces weight loss, because you are minimizing the amount of hours that people are eating. So of course, if I say you can only eat between this many hours, all those other hours that you would be eating, you would be losing weight. So the science does not really support like intermittent fasting as like a long-term solution for weight management. And people, anything you do temporarily leads to temporary results. 
It's permanent solutions that lead to permanent results. So unless you're gonna spend the rest of your life mm. doing intermittent fasting, any of the benefits you perceive you're receiving, whether it's weight management or health benefits, those will also be short-lived. What are the other two choices? Do I, I don't believe in intermittent fasting and? Um, we have a lot of other questions. We can, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. What was it? Oh, I eat breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner. I do believe to eat regularly. You want to eat every four, three to five hours to keep your metabolism working effectively. I can't stand when people don't eat breakfast. It jumps out your metabolism for the day. I don't like when people skip meals, especially that afternoon snack. It actually causes you to overeat at dinner, which is when your metabolism is at its slowest. People that know my messaging, I always say that afternoon snack is a meal. It should offset your hunger at dinner, so you can go to dinner and eat like you know protein and vegetables and have a glass or two or three of wine and be wildly <laughs> present. But breakfast, lunch, snack, and dinner, do not skip meals. Great, okay. The next one is about soy. This is from Lexi P. My question is, what's the real deal with soy? Some say it's good, others say not so much. What do you all think? I, I would defer to a di registered dietitian. I always tell people when they ask me health-based questions, I'm always, I always say I'm not a dietitian, and you had mentioned before how there's a lot of people sort of preaching all this information uh, and they're not um, trained. Well, so. Both of you are so well respected in your spaces, so I think whatever you have to say is valuable, but I'll be happy to go okay. first, um, which is to say that, you know, the interesting thing about soy is that there are many studies that do correlate a high soy intake to a greater risk for breast cancer. Um, and what contains soy? Well, it's things like tofu and edamame and miso. And that ironically, when you look to epidemiologically to Asian cultures, they actually have a much lower instance of breast cancer than we do in this country, and they eat a lot of soy and tofu. So it's, it's a little bit sort of circumcempt, but so I would say the jury is out, and this is where I always say everything in moderation. Um, you want to eat soy in moderation, eat some tofu. It's not going to kill you. Excess amounts, maybe some studies correlate and increase risk for breast cancer, but if you do love tofu and you are vegetarian, that is your source of protein. A recent study came out of Harvard. Um, it was a Walter Willett study, and it was a large study. And they found that women with the highest fiber intake during adolescence and, and um, young adulthood had the least risk factor for breast cancer. And that is because fiber will bind with estrogen, which is also found in soy, and reduce estrogen dominance. So. The solution, if you are going to eat a lot of soy, is eat a lot of fiber so the fiber can pull up the extra estrogen, reduce the estrogen dom dominance, and that will absolutely reduce the risk for breast cancer. For anyone whose moms or grandmas have started like hormone replacement therapy because of menopause, that was always the scare with HRT, was that it was always about um, replacing estrogen, and that's why everyone thought that hormone replacement therapy, or even if someone um, at a very young age had a hysterectomy and they needed HRT, it was that the estrogen increased breast cancer. But if you increase estrogen and you increase progesterone, which now they have figured out for HRT, and you eat a high fiber diet, fiber leaves the progesterone alone, takes the estrogen and lowers it, reducing estrogen dominance. So that's why you know, I always say, please people, become your own healthcare advocate. Go deep. Don't just rely on anyone for like one bit of advice that you read on social media that you even hear in the news because studies change all the time. Um, research this stuff and science is out there. Um, my job is just really to share the science with you, to deliver these messages, because in order to remain a dietitian, I can't rely on what I learned 20 years ago. In order to re um, retain my accreditation, I have, to I have to earn continuing education points. So I have to read studies after study after studies just to be maintain my RD. And therefore, I see myself basically as um, someone who can communicate these studies to the general public through my social media, through lectures, or through just, you know, going out for lunch with my girlfriends. But the research is out there. Um, you know, become your own healthcare advocate, speak to your doctors, speak to your dietitians, um, and make your own decisions. But it really comes down to, it's so boring, but everything in moderation. <laughs> And just a note on soy, non-GMO, organic, fermented, in my opinion, coming from a Japanese background with ancestors who lived into their 90s is okay. I truly believe that. And studies do show that fermented soy is safe. That includes soy sauce, miso, that's miso paste, not necessarily the soup, but you make soup from the paste, and also natto. So that's where I feel the same, where the, the studies are very conflicting because Asian culture does have very low rates of estrogen-related disease, and 
That's why I find it to be a little bizarrely controversial. And everyone in my family is very healthy. It's when they move to the U.S. where their health gets a little whack. Yeah. Like and only my mom's done that, so sorry, Mom. But I mean... <laughs> But truly, I agree, like you have to keep reading the studies and don't believe everything that you read either. And more is not always better, so, and, and less is not always better either. So completely taking soy out of your diet may not be a great solution. Overeating soy may not be a great solution. Right. That's why we always keep coming back to moderation is key. But when we think about um, you know, the, the Asian community where you just said that they don't necessarily have a lot of estrogen related diseases. It's because what we tend to do in this country is we isolate like one thing mm. and then we either remove it completely from our Americanized diet or we insert it thinking it's going to be the panacea that ails us. I'll give you an example, the Mediterranean diet, we've all heard of it. And the Mediterranean diet, supposedly you live the longest, it's the healthiest. So what did we do? We isolated olive oil. Well, you know, they have monounsaturated fats. What we did was we took this one ingredient, olive oil, and we decided to use it liberally. We're pouring it on everything. We're dipping our bread into it. We're pouring it on our pastas. And we think that this food, because it's so heart healthy, is going to make us live longer. Now, yes, if you were to drill down, monounsaturated fats help to reduce, um, you know, your bad cholesterol and raise your good cholesterol. But like I stated earlier, every tablespoon is 135 calories. So when you go out to dinner and the waiter generously like pours it on your bread plate dish and you're dipping away, that could be a few hundred calories. If those few hundred calories are putting weight on you, being overweight increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, which offsets the heart health benefits of all that olive oil. So it's just, as I said, it's moderation, but don't omit olive oil, but don't also think it's a free food. I think it's the same with soy. Use soy you know, moderately, but don't cut it out because one study correlated with a right. greater incidence of breast cancer. Right, okay. Um, the next question is about the Whole30. Um, is it a fad? <laughs> I'll let the others speak to it because I'm going to seem way too opinionated. <laughs> I, I think that Whole30, for people who we were talking before about just being so overwhelmed with wellness, not knowing anywhere to start. I think for people who um, don't maybe perhaps don't have the time to self-educate themselves or just need something to give themselves a place to start, I think it's, it can be really powerful. And I think that what I've seen, I have a lot of people who read Inspiralize and they do the whole 30. And um, I, would, I would say that what ends up happening is they get so invested in the details and sort of the science behind whole 30 because it's written about profusely in her books. Um, they start reading about it and educating themselves that way. So I think it's a good stepping stone because people say, oh, well, you know, these, this way of eating is making me feel better. Why is it making me feel better? What can I pull from this Whole30 that I'm doing and integrate it into my lifestyle to keep feeling this way? Because I would never call it a fad. I just think it's, you know, some, it's a way to give information in a concise way that someone can digest easily and start with. But by no means do I think people should be, that's like their source of nutrition. They start there and Great, okay. that. And how do you feel about collagen? And do you recommend drinking a collagen powder daily? Anyone want to take this one? <laughs> well, I, I feel like we all have our opinions on it, right? It's <laughs> so trendy right now. It, it is about to explode. Like, we've already seen it exploding. It's just going to get even bigger. I've seen more companies coming out with it. Um, I've tested it out. I don't know about you guys, but it definitely works. My hair has gotten a lot fuller and thicker. My nails are a lot firmer. But in no way do I recommend or not recommend anything to anyone. I always tell people, do whatever makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. and, and as a professionally trained chef and somebody who's worked on the line at restaurants for years, my job is to essentially show you guys how to cook these foods. So I can show you how to make a killer collagen matcha latte, um, <laughs> but I'll defer to the, the experts when it comes to the actual should you, shouldn't you. <laughs> Tanya. <laughs> um, I'm all for collagen. I think you can get it through foods. Like I think you can make, as you said, whether it's a killer collagen matcha or a collagen, a collagen, a killer <laughs> collagen um, bone broth. I mean, yes, collagen has been shown to um, to help with plumping up wrinkles, and who doesn't want that help? With helping with joint pain. So, I mean, there are tons of merits to collagen, and um, you know, it's once again, it's it's not going to hurt you, so you can include it, but I always get concerned with people sort of um, over fixating on um, one nutrient 
other than fiber. <laughs> so it's kind of very contradictory. <laughs> but fiber's not in a lot of food. So. Um, but you know, like I, I, I have used the collagen peptides, and there is merit. The studies do yeah. support that collagen is great for um, reducing joint pain um, mm -hmm. and for you know plumping up skin, and I mean, so and, and lining the intestinal tract. So yes, it's it's. But you can get it, you guys, through foods. I mean, of course, you can get it through collagen peptides, which is a great way. But the reason bone broth has become so popular is because the bones which contain collagen naturally are what are creating the broth. So as a dietitian, my methodology and my recommendations are always through foods first. People always ask me like, what supplements do you take? What vitamins do you take? And um, I, I'm remiss to say like, I don't take any because when your diet's really well balanced, you don't really need extra supplementation. Think about the word supplement. It's not called replacement. You're not supposed to be replacing foods in your diet with foods, with, with the supplements or with the pill or powder. It's supposed, to, you're supposed to get your nutrients through foods and then supplements should supplement any imbalance. And imbalance happens, why? Because sometimes you have food aversions, you have food sensitivities, or sometimes you just don't like an entire food group and therefore you must rely on a supplement. So if you can get your collagen through foods first, do it. If not, um, due to the trend and its popularity and it has scientific merit, you can add some collagen peptides to whatever it is that you're eating. Great, I think we have time for one more question. I apologize for not getting to them all. Um, so the last one is about alcohol and what you recommend Drinking, <laughs> what is a good low calorie alcohol? I thought that was a good note to end on. <laughs> Should I take this one? <laughs> was that moment for me? Um, so it was actually one of the things when you're like, what should people like not be doing? You know, when you were asking earlier, and I only said one. You guys do not have to cut out alcohol to lose weight, manage weight. Um, when you think about it in France and in Greece and Italy, they drink wine with lunch and dinner and they don't have the instance of obesity that we do. Mm -hmm. A glass of wine, thankfully, is only 80 calories. A roll with olive oil, that's 360, do the math. <laughs> um, but more so than that, for many of us drinking socially um, or for business, people go after work drinks, it's, it's just a part of our lifestyle. And for some of us drinking um, responsibly, and people always say, well, what do you mean by responsibly? I'm like, you're still standing vertically at the end of the night, that's <laughs> responsible. Um, that the idea of responsible drinking, for many of us, it provides us with a quality of life of sorts. It calms us, it's fun. So when it comes to drinking, um, as I said, it, it absolutely does not interfere with weight loss. If, as long as you are one of these people, oh, look, I understand there are some people when they drink it lowers their inhibitions and they make very poor food choices. That's a very different conversation. But if you can drink responsibly, <laughs> one, two, two, three drinks a night. Um, I would say stick with uh, wine, red or white, the same, 80 calories, two grams of carbs. Why does everyone think wine is so high in carbs? Who in this audience says like, wine's so high in carbs? It's not. A slice of white bread is 15 grams of carbs, a glass of wine is two grams of carbs. So they're not the same. Wine is low in carbs. Great news, applause for wine. <laughs> um, and the other spirits, vodka, tequila, bourbon, scotch, whiskey, zero grams of carbs. So it's the sugary mixers that gets us in trouble. Or like I said, if when you drink you make poor food choices, that gets you in trouble. But having a, a drink for 80 calories, guys, is not interfering with anyone's ability to lose weight or maintain it. So cheers. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, I want to thank um, our amazing panelists this evening. I want to thank all of you for attending.